Hello, hello. What a joy to be here with you all today on this beautiful Wednesday. Right now, we're going to be talking about hypnosis and the mind in relation to what it really takes to change any aspect of our lives. Now, there are things that, you know, perhaps you, you, you do a certain things a certain way, then you want to do it differently, and you accomplish that, and you change a habit of yours, and the problem is solved, no discussion about it. But there are many things in our lives that even though we try to change, it becomes difficult, it becomes a problem. We, we don't seem to accomplish that. And the notorious category of things that we try to change but can't is called, you know, when it, when it really interferes with the quality of your life, it's called an addiction. And if it doesn't become a problem, then we simply call it a habit. So we might do a particular routine in the morning without thinking about it, and it's not particularly harmful, and then we say that you have that habit. But now a person might, let's say, drink too much every time they see a friend, and they realize that that's creating a problem, but they feel unable to stop, and it's interfering with the quality of their lives. At that point, we call it an addiction. So habits, addictions, are really the difference really simply has to do with whether or not it becomes a serious problem in your life. But of course, as a therapist, right, as a hypnotherapist, as a therapist who's also a hypnotist, I ask people who come to see me whether the habits that we have on a daily basis are also a problem insofar as keeping us away from the full extent of what we can be. And in that category, you find things like body weight, which might limit your activities in your life. You find things like levels of prosperity. And you might find things like problems in relationships. We get used to relating to people in a certain way very early on in our lives, but we forget about that. But we carry that mode of relating to others throughout our lives. And in some cases, we say, look, I realize that I'm too aggressive, too compliant, whatever the case might be. I want to change this, but somehow I can't. You see, now it becomes a problem. I realize there's a problem there. I want to change it, but I can't. And so you have three categories of things there that you may want to change, depending on your situation. And if you can change them, great. Nothing else to talk about. Most often, though, we find that we cannot change. It's not so easy. Sometimes it takes a great deal of effort, but it slips back. It slides back. We, we, we keep on, we keep on you know, falling back into old patterns, right? So let's talk about that. Why does that happen? Well, think of your mind as, think of it as a ball, let's say, right? It's not really a ball because look, I got to say this to you. I've been explaining the mind for 30 years, both in sessions, in classes, and I always preface this explanation by saying nobody really knows what it is. I've taken philosophy of mind classes in college. I've taken, nobody really knows what it is. We have a whole bunch of metaphors and a whole bunch of descriptions that may be useful for communication purposes, but the truth is we don't know what it is. It's not really the brain. We know that much. The brain is the brain, but the mind, which some philosophers call an emergent property of the brain, isn't really the brain. It's an emergent, an emergent property but it isn't really the brain. When you, when you think of the mind, think of it, you know, just for conceptual purposes, you know, think of it like as a ball like this, and then it has two halves, two hemispheres, right? The top and the bottom, let's just say. One, we're going to call the conscience mind. And by definition, the other one must be the unconscious. Now, Everything about you that you know, if I were to ask you, what's your name, where do you live, where do you work, that kind of thing, everything about you that you know is part of the conscience mind. I'm conscious of 
these things. But there are things about us that we do not know. And by definition, we call that the unconscious. So, to go back to the example of addictions and habits and problems in our lives and mindsets that keep us stuck, if I were to ask a person who perhaps drinks too much, why do you drink so much or why can't you stop, the person will say, oh, I don't know, I guess I'm an addict or I guess I'm an alcoholic. And that answer isn't really the answer. That is what he has been told. Well, you are an alcoholic. That's a label that has been ascribed to him. But it isn't really an answer that is actionable or that can change the drinking behavior. Therefore, that's not the answer. He's just reciting what he has heard, but it isn't really an answer. The truth is he doesn't know why he does what he does. And we're all in that category because we all have an unconscious mind. That's perfectly normal. When we want to change an aspect of our lives, it isn't... So we have two options. When we want to change something, you have essentially two options. I can use my willpower. I can use strength of character. I can use determination, motivation to behave differently. And it is true. If I do that long enough, eventually that becomes the new habit. And this is why at the first of the year, a lot of people make decisions and they make commitments. But then by the, by the end of the month, most of the stuff has gone away already because it's not so easy to keep those commitments. The other alternative, the alternative to willpower, is to change ourselves from the inside out. Look at your life and ask yourself, why is my life as it is? And we're going to discover that a lot of what we're living today is a reflection in some way of the way we lived the first three years of our lives. For those of you who like the concept of past lives, this lifetime is a repetition of the last lifetime and the previous lifetimes. We repeat the same story over and over until we learn some lessons. There's a really interesting movie that I think addresses that, which is Groundhog Day. The character had to learn a lesson. And the day in his life keeps on being repeated. Well, that's an interesting way of portraying this idea, but we repeat lifetime after lifetime and we meet the same characters until we learn to love and forgive one another. So that part of us that we are unaware of becomes manifest in our daily lives in terms of prosperity, body figure, in terms of relationships, in terms of everything that, you know, our lives as it is. It is as if, it is as if each one of us is a character in a movie, in a play. It is just like that. And the play has already been written for us. And then you say to me, no, but I'm a strong-minded person and I can change my destiny. It is true. It is possible. But you have to apply a ton of willpower. And most often, people have moments of where, where, where they slip back. The alternative to that would be to give the actor a new script so that he or she can act out the life of a different character. If we were to do that, let's say, on the stage of a theater, and this person is acting John Smith, right? And then I say, okay, give me this booklet over here. Give me the script. Now you, now you become Peter Johnson, right? We change the, the script that the person is acting. That actor would become a different character. Absolutely every aspect of our lives here on this earth is an expression not of... It is not the absolute veracity of who we are, but it's a character that we're playing. Some characters that we play make us feel very happy and successful, but it is still a character in the sense that it isn't the totality of what we are. It is like saying that you go to the theater and the character is somehow contending the actor. 
But the actor contains many characters. The actor can perform different characters, and so can we. When we talk about changing our lives, we got to change the script. The script is at the level of the unconscious. Those are the images and emotions that are stored in the unconscious mind. The most effective way to change our lives, in whatever direction you want to change yours, is by changing the images and the emotions that are stored in your unconscious mind. So, if your mind is like this ball that has conscious and unconscious, in order for me to make a change at the level of the unconscious, I'm going to need access to it. It's like saying, if the circuit breaker is off on a particular circuit in the house, and I want to turn it back on, well, I need to have access to the breaker panel. If it's in the other room, I got to go over there and turn it on or turn it off, depending on the situation. We need to have access to the control panel. We need to have access to where those images are stored so that we can effect a change. So this access, the bridges, a gap between the conscious and the unconscious, is called hypnosis. Hypnosis as a phenomenon, just as I have described it, perhaps more, perhaps other people have described it more eloquently, but the basic idea is there. This has been known for, that we know of, at least 3,000 years. And people have been practicing this forever. A lot of what prayer is, a lot of what religion is, a lot of what mythology is, a lot of rituals, a lot of indoctrination, a lot of education, all of that stuff has a lot to do with hypnosis, hypnotic techniques. Life itself is a huge hypnotist. The media, television, stuff like this, you know, we're continuously being bombarded with messages that elicit an emotional response, thus putting us in the hypnotic state, and then the repetition of the content of the message causes us to behave in a certain way. Life itself is a hypnotist. We're all familiar with this. There's nothing illicit or dangerous or bad about hypnosis because we're, we have all been hypnotized by life itself, by our parents, by our teachers, by our educators. We're all a product of the hypnotic state because we all behave in certain ways, whether it's a small thing or a big thing, that we feel unable to stop. And the extent to which we cannot make an instant change is the extent to which that behavior is the product of a hypnotic suggestion. Even if you didn't visit a professional hypnotist during childhood, during your life, we've been hypnotized to behave that way. Now what we want to do is consciously make a difference in our lives, consciously change our destiny. In order for that to happen, we're going to have to relax and go into the unconscious portion of the mind and manipulate those images to the way that we want them to be. Because now you're the author of your own destiny and you can begin to make changes. Ultimately, whether you live lifestyle A or lifestyle B, it's not that important. But what is important is what kind of person we are. Becoming a better human being, becoming nicer to others, becoming more generous, becoming more grateful, those kinds of things do matter because that has to do with the purpose for which we're born. So, going forward, whenever you hear the word hypnosis, rather than cringing and thinking that there's something illicit, occult, dangerous, bad, manipulative about it, think of it as the very same thing that we have all been experiencing our whole lives, except that we can actually do it in a professional, in a clinical sort of way to improve the quality of our lives. Now I know what everybody's thinking at this point. They say, yeah, but what about the misuse of hypnosis? Can it be misused? And to that I answer, do you know of anything that cannot be misused? Has the Bible been misused? Has religion been misused? Has a knife ever been misused? Has a car been misused? Has alcohol been misused? Do you know of anything at all on this planet that has not been misused or that cannot be misused? Of course, hypnosis can be misused, but it isn't the fault of hypnosis. It's the fault of the user of hypnosis. So, 
you know, is this whole conversation about guns, right? Well, well, guns kill people. Guns don't kill people. People who use or misuse guns kill people. So, you know, should we eliminate guns because a few criminals kill other people? You know, it's like saying, okay, so we shouldn't use hypnosis because a few people may have misused it. It is a conversation that really goes nowhere because, for that matter, there's this joke that was played by somebody several years ago talking about dihydrogen oxide, which is the chemical formula for water, basically. And people, you know, he was saying how people, you know, aspire this thing into their lungs and they're dying. He's talking about drowning and stuff like this, right? And they started this movement. I don't know how much of it is fake or true, you know, but they wanted to like ban the substance from the country because a lot of people are dying because of dihydrogen oxide. You know, yes, water can be misused too. I mean, so everything can be misused, right? Everything can kill.